quick review. We learned yesterday that there are five kinds of basic energy relationships in communities. Um, predation and competition being the obvious ones, right? Killing and eating your prey is predation. Uh, having the same prey or other resource is competition. And then those relationships that happen when you live very close together called symbiosis, where uh, like the example with the hippo of the worms was parasitism where one benefits and the other's harmed. With the ox pecker that jumps into the hippo's mouth, the bird that pecks it between its teeth, which was mutualism. And then the, the gross fish that swims behind the hippo where the, the hippo doesn't care, but the fish gets nutrients, that's commensalism. Um, which one's that, do you think? Yeah, uh, except here's the thing. It's a confusing one because that little crustacean, what it actually does is, yeah, consume the fish's tongue. It actually eats the fish's tongue. But then like for the rest of its life, it clamps its back legs onto the stump of the fish's tongue and serves as the fish's tongue for the rest of the fish's life. Like, like the fish is fine using this weird little alien as its tongue for the rest of its life. And as serving as its tongue, it's getting, you know, constant food that way. And yeah, the fish lots of its tongue, but if it doesn't have any ill effects after that, do you really call it parasitism or is this now commensalism? Scientists are a little divided about that, but it's an interesting case. Chan? If, if it actually noticeably decreases the amount of food the fish gets, but the fish seems to be fine. But yeah, no, I, I agree. I think, I think I lean towards parasitism as well, especially since it's ate its tongue, but it's a weird case. Anyway, I just thought you should know about that. Do you know that word? Niche. It's sometimes used in our everyday language. You probably don't use it much. Uh, we talk about like a product that has a niche market, which means that only a very small slice of the population is going to buy it. Or we could say where you might have heard it is that, you know, talking about someone who just didn't fit in. You know, they, they didn't like school and they weren't getting good grades and they didn't have any friends. And then they, joined the blank, they joined the marching band or the football team or whatever. And man, they've really found their niche now. They really, they're doing well now, okay? So it sort of means a way to fit in. Um, and that's kind of what it means in ecology too. It means exactly like, like it's more complicated than just you joined the football team. It's like what you eat, where you live, You know what you eat like like are you a an herbivore or a, a carnivore and uh or or something else you don't fit into those categories how do you get your food are you a photosynthesizer like a plant predator if you're a predator what kind of predator are you like a a, a sit and wait predator like an antlion or a spider where you build a trap and wait for something to fall in, or are you a uh, chase it down kind of predator, right? Like a cheetah. You ever seen a cheetah actually catch its food? Different than I thought it would be. Like, you know, a lion, you're familiar with the lion just argh, jumping on the back of something. Cheetah just runs until it thinks the antelope is tired enough and then <laughs> and takes a swipe at it from behind and its back legs get tangled up and it goes down in a heap and then the cheetah jumps on it. It's almost like cheating, cheetah, huh? That's stupid. Uh, when's it active? Is it at night? What do we call that? Nocturnal, good. During the day, what do we call that? Not dayturnal, diurnal. Or, um, great word. There's a word for being active just at dawn and dusk. Crepuscular, isn't that great? Never thought I'd see that 
word in like my everyday life unless I was reading about science. And then I was playing a video game the other day and in the settings on the video game, crepuscular rays. I don't know, I must mean like for sunsets or something when they, when they, if you, it probably takes extra computing power to show those or something. I don't know, it's weird. Uh, where does it live? Is it uh, just walking around on the ground in front of God and everybody or is it up in the trees? What level of the trees does it live in? environment like a blade of grass is it just living on that entire you know its entire life on one plant all this stuff goes into niche all of it and what you get is this kind of picture of exactly how that critter fits into its ecosystem and the reason we talk about that is because niches can overlap does that sound right that niches can overlap that that two different species could have the same food live in the same place, be out at the same time of day? Sure, but there's a rule called the competitive exclusion principle. And what that rule says is that no two species can occupy exactly the same niche. niche. No two organisms, no two species, no two species can occupy the same niche in the same ecosystem. Why do you think that is? Why can't they? Chance. Because they would have to compete for resources. Yeah, and the more they overlap, right? Like they didn't start out completely overlapping. They'd have to get there somehow, right? They start out different. They're evolving to overlap more and more. Well, the more they overlap, the fiercer that competition, like you said, gets. And what happens once the competition gets strong enough? Well, one of them certainly starts to win, right? And the other one starts to lose? Sure. And yes, you're absolutely right that a species can be competed into extinction. It doesn't usually happen that way. What do you think usually happens? No, no, you're not gonna change that much. What do you think usually happens? Yeah, they evolve, enough of them die that are getting competed out of that niche that the ones that are left are the ones that are able to exploit a different niche. You can have your own for now. Right, like, like maybe it's time of day, maybe that's the, the, the last straw and, and it's the, the, the ones of the species that's losing that can operate a little later at night that live because they're not being competed out as much by the, the diurnal one that's winning, right? And so little by little, that losing species loses so much that it becomes nocturnal and now they're not overlapping anymore, they're not out at the same time of day, they're fine, right? So yes, they can be competed out of their niches even do an into extinction, but usually the way it happens is they change. They evolve into a slightly different niche. Does that make sense? That's thing one today, the concept of niche and competitive exclusion. Uh, it fits very well with, it should sound familiar um, when you think about the initial uh, intro project you did with the slides. And, and the, the slide that may be best, although there's probably three that make sense, the one that fits the best is probably the, the guy that brought the Shakespeare birds to the United States because he likes Shakespeare, right? And each of those new birds not only didn't necessarily have any predators, but occupied a full niche in its new environment, right? Each of those birds has a niche that it's gonna exploit in the United States. And if it's better at exploiting its niche, its new niche than the birds that were already there, they get competed out, right? And so that's what happens is we lost several songbirds because of this and several others changed their niches and are slightly different now than they were. Um, okay, the other thing today is about energy flow. And I think this is gonna be quite familiar to you. Maybe the word trophic level isn't familiar, but the concept certainly is that you know that we all ultimately get our energy from? Where do we all get our energy? 
where does our food get its energy? The sun. If you go enough steps, right, your food is energy from the sun. No, I just eat meat. No, you don't. You eat animals that ate plants. The plants got their energy from the sun. Your energy is coming from the sun too. So if we're counting the number of steps you are eating away from the sun, that's called your trophic level. And I think mostly you know this stuff. Your terminology in eighth grade might have been slightly different. Like what name did you have for the organisms that can photosynthesize? What would you call them in eighth grade or seventh grade or whenever it was? You remember? Plants and and the bacteria and, and other one-celled organisms that can, can make their own food, what do you call them? I think what I use, well, go ahead, Tyler. Good, so, so what I sometimes hear is primary producers, which can get confusing. Um, we, in this class, we're just gonna call them producers. Everything depends on them, all your food depends on producers. It either is producers or it depended on producers. They're the only ones that can unlock the energy coming from that big nuclear engine in the sky, the sun. It's not just plants, although they're the biggest. Lots of photosynthetic bacteria out there, one-celled protists, algae, which don't quite qualify as plants a lot of times. A word that you should know, uh, but if you don't, make sure you write it down, is autotrophs. We can classify plants as producers because they produce all the biomass for the ecosystem. We can also call them autotrophs because they are able to support themselves. They make their own food. That's what that means. Troph really means to eat. The word troph is a, is a root that means to eat. Everybody else the general term for everybody else that's written on the side there, write it down too, is heterotrophs. So autotrophs make their own food. Heterotrophs have to eat other, that's what hetero means is other, have to eat other organisms for their food. So if plants are producers, what are we gonna call the things that eat plants? They're not producers, they're consumers, good. And so the ones that eat just plants, we're gonna call primary consumers. Lots of words that mean kind of the same thing here. Herbivores is another word for primary consumers. Then there's carnivores, right? Things that eat other animals. And if they just eat primary consumers, we call them secondary consumers. Consider them carnivores that eat herbivores. And if, um, what's, what is, what's the third level gonna be? Primary, secondary, the art people that know the third one? Tertiary, very good. With a T-I for that sh sound. So those are carnivores that eat other carnivores. Can it go further? Yes. There's caternary, there's probably in I don't know what you can say it on the fifth level, but not much on land. Mostly on land. It doesn't go much further than tertiary. In the water, aquatic, for a couple of reasons, aquatic food chains do often go further than that. And it has to do with warm and cold bloodedness. And we'll talk about that later. 
Is that it? Does everything fit into one of those four categories? Nope. There's more. What about a mushroom? Is that a living thing? Heck yeah, it's a fungus. It's not one of those four. What, what, how do mushrooms get their energy? Good, most of them grow on dead stuff. Not stuff that they killed, but stuff that was already dead. And they help break it down. We call all of those guys, uh, you know, the, the fungi, the, the bacteria that break down dead stuff, we call them decomposers. And thank goodness for them. Without them, man, you're going outside and you're hip deep in dead stuff. Decomposers recycle all that stuff for us to use. Okay, is that it? Everybody fit into one of those? Producers, primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary and decomposers. And then there's Gavin. No, you, there's you. Yeah, what are you? What'd you have for dinner last night? Mac and cheese, good. Anything else? Oh, that sounds great. BLT and mac and cheese? That's a solid meal. So what's, Gavin? Where does he fit? Huh. What does that mean? Gavin doesn't fit in just one of those because he's eating mac and cheese. The macaroni is a plant product, right? It's from wheat. But the cheese, depending on what kind of mac and cheese it was, that cheese powder, I don't know. But cheese is an animal product. Cheese is an animal product. And the bacon, that's pig, right? But then the lettuce and tomatoes, is, uh, that's producers he's eating, and the bread is producers. So yeah, he qualifies as what we call an omnivore, and lots of organisms are omnivores. So that's the stuff you should already mostly know, and it seems like you do. Tomorrow, we will go into the energy flow stuff that you don't know. The, the stuff that teaches us why it's so easy to get rid of top predators, like in one of your scenarios in the first project. I'm gonna mostly assume that you've got the food web thing down. We'll say a couple of words about it tomorrow, but mostly they tell me I don't need to teach you that. Mm-hmm. I thought you said he just ate plants anyway. Regardless, I mean, what's really going to happen is the fish is going to die from the acidity of the orange juice. But um, yeah, no, he's still eating just plants because the uh, orange is a plant. There you go. If the fish eats the bacon bits, yes, it is now an omnivore. Absolutely. And that does happen. Um, okay, what I've got for you is the chapter four guided reading. So while I pass that out, could you please get out the chapter three guided reading? And I will give you points for that. 